Hi, I'm Dwayne Pinto here in San Diego at the Sky 2015 meeting. I'm here with my colleague, Dr. Jeff Chambers, who joins us, uh, I guess, is a, a good move from uh, Minneapolis to the warm weather in uh, Southern California. It is definitely a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Yeah, Thank and you. Uh, Jeff is the uh, PI of the Orbit 2 trial, which is a study looking at patients with calcified lesions undergoing PCI with atherectomy. So welcome, Jeff. Thanks Thank for joining you. Thank us. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here out of the chills of Minnesota to warm <laughs> Southern California. Yeah, definitely. Well, listen, Jeff, tell me about uh, your trial and the patient population that was studied. So the, the patient population is patients with severely calcified coronary arteries. And there's not a lot known about these patients. They haven't really been studied extensively. We do know, though, that they're very difficult to treat. These lesions are a nightmare for the interventionalist. They're prone to dissections. They have a higher rate of angiographic complications. Your stents don't fully expand. So it's really a difficult group. So the patients we enrolled in the study had to have very stringent criteria. They had to have severe coronary calcium. They had to have calcium on both sides of the arterial wall on angiography and at least 15 millimeters of length. So they're more severe than the standard core lab definition for severe calcium. And then we took these patients and we treated them with orbital atherectomy. So it's a really cool device. It both orbits and rotates. So you can take a small device, it's a 125 crown, that orbits at different speeds, 80,000 on low speed, 120,000 RPMs on high speed, and it, it contacts the wall, it uh, sands the hard portion of the artery away, so calcium, and pushes the soft portion out of the way. And uh, with that, we were able to test these patients. And it wasn't a standalone trial, it was a stent facilitation trial, so to make sure we could facilitate stent placement in these complex patients. Right, so a couple of ideas. So we know from the prior atherectomy days that it is a facilitative uh, device in general. Uh, and it is remarkable that with this patient group where for the interventional cardiologist, this you know, calcified group is the one where you unexpectedly are in a three-hour case. Right, right. And uh, it's remarkable that these patients have not been really studied yeah. extensively. It is really remarkable. I think part of it is, you know, if you look back to rotational atherectomy, the long-term results, the acute gain and the acute um, outcomes are very good. But then the long-term data hasn't been there. So if you look at the most recent data with the Rotaxa study, it showed that there was a great acute gain but more late loss. So at that point, you really only limited it to patients who needed to, it to get a stent down. Mm -hmm. So the question with this new device is, first of all, does it facilitate stent placement? And in the trial, there, was about 40, there were 443 patients enrolled. Uh, stent delivery was 98%, which is very good in this complex group. And then the second question is, does it change long-term outcomes? And it was a single-arm trial, prospective single-arm, multi-center trial, but it wasn't randomized. Um, it was randomized to historical controls because the FDA said there's no um, device specifically approved to treat severe calcium. So the question is, does it change long-term outcomes? So we looked at uh, endpoints like cardiac death, TVR, TLR, and we found that at least at one year and then the two-year data we presented today, the TLR rate was 8.1% at two years, which is very good for this difficult to treat patient population. One of the problems is we don't have a really good comparator group. There is another ongoing study called the MACE study, which will look at patients with severe calcium in the current era, uh, standard of care, which is uh, rotablator or just drug eluting stents alone, and that'll give us a little bit of a comparator group, although not head to head. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, our thought is that these patients' um, long term outcomes are worse and that with the orbital atherectomy, the outcomes are better, but that remains to be proven. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, you mentioned that there was angiographic uh, inclusion. You know, when I took the cardiology boards, uh, it was you know, 270 degrees of right. calcium on right. IVUS, but uh, I can't remember the last time I did IVUS to figure out whether I was gonna have trouble. Right, so a lot of guys will describe this as a railroad tracks. If you see the railroad tracks, you know you have severe calcium. So that was basically our criteria. Had to be 15 millimeters in length and calcium on both sides of the arterial wall without cardiac motion. And those are the worst of the worst, and you know those are very, when you see that, you should think, I need to do something to change the outcome in that case. Mm -hmm. And Jeff, you know, uh, 
the idea of there being a historical control, that's certainly a limitation of the study. Do you think it's a, a fatal flaw or do we, or can we learn from this? I think we can learn from it. I really do. Um, it would be nice to have randomized data, which is always the best. But in the absence of that, this is really the first device to look at this group in over 20 years uh, in a large scale group. Now you have the Rotaxis, which was a few years ago, but really a large scale, almost 500 patient study. And I think, uh, although there's not great comparison, if you look at the drug-eluting stent, uh, two-year data or even the one-year data, so let's take the Orbitu one-year data, drug-eluting stent, TLR 3.4%, which is very similar to what you'd expect with a drug-eluting stent, whatever drug-eluting stent mm -hmm. trial you, 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 you take. So in my mind, you've taken a lesion, you've decalcified it, and made it a drug-eluting stent-like result. Now that remains to be definitively proven, but it's certainly suggestive that the outcomes might be better. Great. And tell me, uh, too, Jeff, a little bit uh, about the device and the setup and its use. You know, yeah. I use a fair bit of Rota, but it's not insignificant to set up. Right, right. So there's two reasons to use a new device. One is that it's easier to use or gets you a better acute outcome, or two is the long-term results. So we've talked a little bit about the potential long-term results, but in terms of ease of use, very easy to use. So the device, you just open the package, you put it on the table. All you have to do is plug it in. There's an electric motor drive that you plug in, and there's a saline pump, and you connect it. So that's all you have to do. Everything else is on the table. Uh, you have your two speeds, low speed, high speed, on, off, and advancer. Uh, it takes you about two minutes to set up. The other key feature about the device is it treats both anti-grade and retrograde. So your treatment times are very short. So in the trial, our average treatment time was 68 seconds. So you can take a severely calcified lesion, make it non-calcified, deliver a stent, and be done very quickly. Mm -hmm. So to put it back in reality, you know it works when my techs see a calcified lesion, they go and get the device. You know, when I bring out rotor blade, they groan, oh, I gotta get roll the tank, eyes, yeah. they roll your eyes. Yeah. But now they're grabbing the CSI device for me to start. Like, they want me to use it because they know their day will end faster if I use it. Interesting, interesting. Yeah. I am worried yeah. that that tank falls on my leg or something yeah. like that. Yeah. 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 Uh, and, uh, but both devices require their own wire, so the rotor wire and then the Viper wire of retrograde CTO fame. Yes, uh, yes, know, exactly. Is, so yeah. the, the uh, rotor wire 009, this is, the Viper wire is the only wire you can use with it. 012, so it's a little ro more robust, a little bit better platform to stand over. And right, it's CTO fame. It was the longest wire we had, yeah. so we used it in retrograde CTOs because yeah. it had that extra length. Right. And it makes a very good rail. Yeah, great. Yeah. So, uh, Jeff, we talked a little bit about the results. Anything more on that, or you want to tell us about the economic results as well? So let's move on to the economic results. Um, we, since we didn't have a control arm, it's a little bit limited. So what could we compare to? So in the, the, today's era of healthcare economics, we always want to try and determine if we're providing value or not. So we were able to use the Medicare data as a compare group. So there's a new diagnosis code, 414.4, mm -hmm. that codes for severe calcium. Mm -hmm. So we're able to compare the Orbit 2 data, uh, patients over the age of 64. There's about 300 patients in that group. And we're able to find 300 patients in Medicare um, from 17 hospitals that coded reliably for severe calcium. And we looked at outcomes. And we looked at different endpoints. The first was the immediate procedure, so hospital outcomes. And we found that the length of stay was less with the orbital atherectomy device than with the Medicare data, despite the Medicare patients having a little bit higher percentage of outpatients. Mm. So that was interesting. And you know, you wonder, so why does that happen? Um, it seemed like there were less issues with complications, and that led to shorter length of stay. Mm -hmm. Um, there is a, going to be an um, abstract presented by Rich Slofmitz uh, later today. I think it's being presented right now. Um, so it'll be interesting to see his findings in a real-world patient population. Sure. The second endpoint we looked at was the, basically the, the post-hospital to one year. And we compared that to another study, the Acuity Horizons trial, which was able to look at patients with severe calcium. So that was an acute coronary syndrome trial, and they were able to reanalyze the angiograms find patients with moderate and severe calcium, and they looked at outcomes. So we were able to compare to that group in terms of long-term mortality. And we found that the mortality in that it was 2.6% less than that group, although the groups are a little bit different. But that translated to a long-term uh, cost-effectiveness savings uh, of about, uh, about uh, $12,000 in terms of quality life years saved. So we had a significant savings. The definition for what is a valuable study is less than 50,000 per life year saved, and we were at 12,000. Mm -hmm. So it shows both cost savings in terms of 
less revascularizations, lower length of stay, and then quality life years. But it's certainly predicated on the idea that getting a better acute result will translate into a longer term benefit and uh, possibly a survival benefit. Uh, however, a one or two percent mortality benefit would be a very large bar to right. overcome. Right, it would absolutely be a large bar to overcome. Yeah. So, you know, we need additional studies. Uh, the May study that we talked about will be another economic comparator group to really look at that. Mm -hmm. So at least at the glance, with the information we have available today, um, suggests that it is potentially beneficial. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very exciting. Uh, very exciting new technology, longer term outcome, getting some of the information we want in, uh, to get in order to really bring this back into the cath lab and bring, bring atherectomy back. Yeah, it's great. I mean, I think once you have a good tool, you start realizing how big the problem was. So, you know, we knew calcium was a problem, but we didn't everything really easy, quick and easy and effective to treat it with. Now we have a technology. Now we'll relook at the space and the disease state and examine it. And I'm excited about the ongoing studies, just looking at the disease state and trying to help people. Yeah. And Jeff, in closing, uh, you know, we're primarily interventionalists listening to you. So how about your three top tips and tricks with uh, atherectomy using this uh, device? Okay, that's great. So my first trick is that when you start, you want to put the device, uh, the nose cone of the device into the lesion a little bit, pull back and take the tension off because it can jump forward. The second and my main point would be to go very, very slow as you advance, one millimeter a second. And your first pass through, you want to go engage, disengage, not fast, but engage, disengage, work your way through the lesion. After that, the device is still treating, even though you don't feel any resistance. So treat till you don't hear any change in pitch or any resistance. But then even if you still treat, the device is orbiting and you're still getting some benefit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so those would be my you know, two major points. Uh, the third point then I would say is once you're done, test it with a, a compliant balloon. If it doesn't expand, treat some more. Yeah. Great. Well, and you know what? Uh, I didn't think of it until you said that just now is uh, you don't need to exchange for uh, wire. You can always go back and, and do atherectomy again if the balloon you didn't can. expand. Yeah, and that's what we recommend. So try your balloon, go one to one. If it doesn't expand, go back and treat some more. Yeah, yeah. great. Hey, listen, thanks for joining thank me. Thank you very uh, much. Yeah, I appreciate it was, the uh, opportunity. Very fun. And uh, thank you for joining us uh, today here at Sky 2015.